Hello everyone, uh, today is a special Christmas episode. As you can see, I'm not wearing a tie and we have a fantastic guest for this special Christmas holiday episode. Her name is uh, Chantel Shea. She is a partner with Davies, Ward, Phillips and Weinberg LLP, also known as Davies. Everyone knows this firm. She went to law school with me. I went to law school with her many, many years ago. And without further ado, I want to introduce Chantel Shea. Hello, Chantel. Hi, Pilat. How are you this morning? I'm very good. Thank you. It's really great to have you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for coming here. I wanted to talk to you for a long time, and I'm really glad that uh, we are finally doing this. I want to start from the very beginning. You got your bachelor's from, from Laurentian University, right? Yes, that's right. Well, I guess from Laurentian University, but uh, I'm from Barrie originally and uh, at Georgian College up here in Barrie, they have university partnerships. So my degree is from Laurentian, but I had the pleasure of doing it actually at Georgian College, which is close to home. Where are you actually from? Well, I'm, I'm actually from Innisfil, which is just south of Barrie, but uh, Barrie is, is where I, I hail from generally and, and where all of my uh, colleagues chirp at me about being from. So I, I go with Barry. <laughs> you studied psychology at uh, Laurentian, correct? Yes, that's right. Why did you study psychology? Uh, did, was it a conscious choice or was it just something that you stumbled into? If I'm being honest, I would describe it as the path of least resistance. Uh, I knew that I wanted to go to law school and I wanted to do something that interested me and where I was relatively confident that I could get good grades uh, and psychology seemed to fit the bill. And ultimately, uh, when I followed through, it was both of those things. It was very interesting and something that seemed to come naturally to me. Although the, the multiple choice exams were not very good preparation for law school exams. Well, but you obviously did well in uh, your undergrad because you were admitted to Osgood, arguably a good law school, hard to get into, and you went to law school uh, right after your undergrad, correct? Yes, I took, uh, I think, about a year in between um, because I did my, my undergrad part-time for the last semester or two, um, so I think there was about a, a year and a bit in between the, the end of my degree and the beginning of law school. So why did you take your uh, last year part time? Uh, for work purposes, actually. So I worked full time throughout the entirety of my undergrad, 40 plus hours a week, uh, which is actually why I made the decision to, to stay close to home. I started at York University and was doing the commute and I was just finding it a bit challenging uh, trying to get into university studies and make that commute and work full time. Um, so that was the reason why I did the, the part time for the last bit. Well, you know, I always thought you were superhuman in law school. I never told you that, but uh, I think this is a <laughs> good opportunity as any to tell you. <laughs> so uh, you went to Osgood, you did your three years at Osgood, and you did a lot of moots in Osgood, right? I remember that, and um, it sort of suggests some interest in litigation, although uh, law school, I guess, is just a very premature place to decide uh, or to know exactly what kind of lawyer you're going to be. But did you have a, a firm interest in litigation early in law school? Yeah, although I, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what a, a litigator was, but I knew what a trial lawyer was. I grew up watching a whole lot of Matlock and I wanted to be just like Matlock. So not exactly like Matlock uh, now in my current profession, but, you know, mooting was one of those things where it was really kind of practical and one of the best opportunities in law school to emulate what it was actually like to be a lawyer. You know, with things like transactional law or tax law, it's a bit more difficult to get a feel, whereas litigation, uh, the opportunity to moot really gives you a sense of what it's like to, to do the job and be on your feet. And I did the, the first year moot, I think the Learner's Cup was the first one we did when we were in, in school together, Pulat. And when I did that, I just absolutely loved it. It was like an adrenaline sport. So really did any other moot that I was able to after that. And I know, I think you did some international moots, didn't you? I didn't do international. I did the, the Laskin moot. So that's a, an Alaska. administrative and, and constitutional moot. 
Um, and it's right. bilingual as well. So our team generally had uh, English mooters and then French speaking pleaders as well. Uh, and then I did it in my second year and placed very poorly. And so uh, as a testament right. to my resilience, I did the Laskin again in my third year and got first place oralist overall. So it was really uh, for me a big accomplishment having done so poorly in my second year. <laughs> well, I, so I told you superhuman. So. Uh... Davis, did, did you summer there as well? You were an articling student, but did you summer there second summer? I did, yes. My, uh, my mentor in law school, he actually was a, a mooter as well, and he was two years ahead of me, and he got hired at Davies and spoke very highly of it. So as one often does with their mentors, I kind of emulated and wanted to follow in his footsteps. And when I interviewed at the firm, it really just fit the bill. I, I loved all of the people mm -hmm. I met and the challenges that were presented. So started at Davies in 2009, I guess, and I've been there ever since. Yeah, I remember in law school, Davies really stood apart from the pack. I mean, there was this tier, the top tier of law firms, but Davies, I remember, was one of the coolest. Uh, either they had the highest salary for incoming law students or something like that, right? So they were really s special, but uh, I, I understand why you picked Davis, but why do you think they picked you? Was it the moots? Was it the grades? What do you think was this profile that convinced them to hire you? It's an interesting question because now I'm very heavily involved in the student recruitment process. I generally do student interviews and I've been in the so-called war room where, you know, we evaluate potential candidates and it's really interesting because candidates are so diverse and they come from such different backgrounds. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what it was. I had good grades, but I didn't have the best grades in our class. I wasn't ultimately a gold medalist or, or anything close to that. Um, so I like to think that it was my resilience and the, the diversity of experiences in my resume. You know, I was working full time when I was an undergrad and continued to work when I was in law school um, and just had, I think, experiences in my background that were quite different from perhaps some of the other candidates who followed more traditional paths. And I think the fact that I'm here this many years later speaks to the fact that they have done a good job in their recruiting efforts to look at folks that maybe don't come from, you know, strict business backgrounds, haven't done internships with, you know, banks or other law firms in their early years, but, you know, still have the, the capacity to be highly successful. Right. So Davis is known for the litigation department and you're a litigation partner at Davis today. But I know that Davis does more than just litigation. Can you tell us about Davis? Uh, describe this law firm. What makes it special? So the firm is actually principally a, a transactional firm. So we have I might get this wrong, but I think between 120 and 130 lawyers presently. Um, so we're among the smallest of, of the, the so-called seven sister firms. And most of those lawyers, probably around 80 or so are corporate transactional lawyers. Um, and our litigation group is a smaller subset. So there are fewer than 20 of us, um, but we do punch above our weight class. You know, there are firms across the city with much larger litigation groups, you know, multiple the size of ours. Um, um, and they do kind of, it seems, the same number of high profile cases. So we have a disproportionate number of what, what we describe as kind of bet the company cases, where it's really, you know, companies' biggest cases that are facing them that, that we often take on some of the most challenging cases. Um, and that's one of the things that the firm is best known for is dealing with clients kind of highest profile and most challenging issues. We do a lot less of what I would describe as kind of day-to-day -day or routine litigation. Um, we don't have kind of a lot of the same types of files that you see over and over. Um, but that's been great for me because I have learned uh, about so many different industries. I've been, you know, a mile underground in uh, an active gold mine. Um, I could probably describe to you how to build the injection unit of an injection molding machine. Um, I know a great deal about thoroughbred horse racing, and it's because the variety of cases that I encounter is, is almost infinite. Um, so that's really how I would describe our firm and our practice is just the ability to kind of take that skill set to deal with very complex matters and apply it across a variety of industries. Mm -hmm. So you just described a very generalist litigation uh, practice, and this reminded me of my interview with other, our other classmate, Ren. 
ran book calls, uh, when I asked him what kind of person they look for when they hire uh, to their firm, Pallier Roland, and he said generalists, right? So this, this seems to be a pattern among top tier elite litigators. They look for people who can quickly learn different new subject areas, uh, client uh, industries, and so on. Uh, I know that you also do class actions defense, correct? I do, yes. So that's probably, I get it varies right now. Class action defense is probably about 40 to 50% of my practice. Um, at various points in my career, it's been more than that, but usually it hovers around the 50% mark, uh, in particular competition class actions. I do quite a bit of. Do you do only defense? Do you act only for uh, defendants in class actions? Yes, only defense. In, in my experience, I've only done class action defense. And I think for the most part, if you ask my colleagues, we have historically only done defense work. Um, and that's usually, I think, probably for, for conflict reasons, uh, not necessarily legal conflict, but often business conflict reasons. Uh, but there are some firms, for example, you know, you were chatting about Wren, their firm, Pallier Roland, is one that will often do both plaintiff side and defense side, um, but Davies generally is only on the defense side. Mm -hmm. I recently spoke with David Stearns, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, I interviewed him for the show as well. He does uh, exclusively plaintiff side class actions. Uh, 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 he, he's no? forgetting about the one case we have together where he is on for a defendant. So he's actually oh, a yeah? member of one of our, yeah, one of our defense side cases. Uh, and I was quite excited to see him because I was hoping we would get some insights on plaintiff's thoughts on, on the various defenses we usually advance. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for correcting the record. Uh, well, but uh, he was quite um, unhappy with the uh, class actions reform we had in Ontario this, this year. Uh, he believes that the new uh, certification test is too stringent. What is your take on, uh, on this test, on, on these reforms? So it's, uh, as you, you may know, and as the, the viewers might know, the, the test in Ontario was previously um, much less stringent than the comparable test in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., you have to establish essentially that uh, a class action is superior. It's the superior method of proceeding um, and that the common issues predominate over any individual issues. Um, and Ontario has now adopted a similar test. Um, it is aimed at, I think if you look at the, the Hansard, the legislative debates um, and the, the publications mm -hmm. that have come out, it, it's aimed at leveling the plaintiff fields for defendants and for corporations and to make Ontario uh, more friendly to companies um, because the, the previous test um, was extremely lax. There, you know, there is a mm -hmm. quote out there, I won't name, the, the judge, but an Ontario judge has said, I believe publicly, that he would certify a ham sandwich. And that was really the regime that we were living with before the amendments. Um, you were approached by a client who was named as a defendant in a class action. And even if there was nothing to the allegations, you had to tell them that unless you had some like spicy mustard or mayo on your ham sandwich, um, the case was probably going to be certified. So from a defense side perspective, uh, the, the current articulation of the test, I think, will level that playing field. Um, the one difficulty which applies to both plaintiff and defense side lawyers alike, though, is the diminished number of cases being commenced in the province, um, because the balance of Canada still has the, the test that used to apply in Ontario, so a much easier test for plaintiffs to meet. And we actually have seen in the period since the amendments came into force in Ontario that fewer actions are being commenced in Ontario and instead they're being started in other jurisdictions, principally BC. So from a, a class actions industry perspective, um, you know, it will be interesting to see what happens in, in the coming months and years uh, and whether Ontario kind of falls off the map in terms of having a, an established and developed class action practice, yeah. at least until we have some jurisprudence surrounding how this new test will be interpreted. If judges essentially look at it and say that it's not much different from what was there, it's, it's really a matter of semantics, then it might be much ado about nothing. But as I said, from, from a class actions industry perspective, uh, on the lawyer side, we are seeing fewer cases to take on. Right, so it's obvious you do very high stakes litigation on a regular basis. You said bed the farm litigation, that's a common term. 
you work on class actions. Class actions are almost always extremely high stakes. I'm sure that in the beginning of your career, you also had a taste of lower stakes litigation. Maybe you did some small claims court matters, smaller uh, cases. What is one or what are the one or two things, in your opinion, from uh, the height of your experience now as, as a litigator? What are one or two things that separate high stakes, bed the farm litigation? Uh, from the rest of litigation, from the point of view of everyday law practice, uh, from the point of view of how you apply yourself as the lawyer practicing? Well, the, the one thing I'd note is that when you're dealing with bet the company litigation, you're generally dealing with well-heeled defendants who, who do have the resources to allow you to kind of track down every lead review every document in a great amount of detail, uh, you know, meet repeatedly with whether it's external experts or your colleagues internally to really work through the issues in a way that by the time you get to trial, there is no stone that's unturned. Um, you know the matter and the brief inside and out, uh, cases and facts alike. Um, when you're dealing with um, smaller cases, the practical reality is that clients, whether you're on for plaintiffs or defendants, and outside of the class action context, we do act for both plaintiffs and defendants, um, but clients just simply can't afford uh, for you to take the innumerable number of hours required to learn a complex brief in and out. Um, so you really have to be more tailored, more laser focused in terms of where you focus your efforts and in reaching consensual resolutions in a way that is in the client's best interests. Um, one of the difficult things is sometimes you'll get cases where your client is undoubtedly in the right and you know it, um, but because of the nature of the matter, um, it might necessitate a six week trial, for example, to actually get a final resolution on the merits. And often a six week trial, regardless of what your billing rate is, um, the, a smaller matter just can't bear the burden of having a lawyer take the time required to prepare for and then litigate a matter um, to that depth. And so, you know, the approach has to be tailored to what the client's needs are, um, but also from a practical perspective, what the lawyer can accomplish in the budget that's allocated. Uh, and so that's the, the biggest distinction that I've noticed. Um, but it's always helpful because I do a mix of kind of both types of cases. We still do have some smaller litigation matters. And I think my experience on more complex matters allows me more quickly to focus in on what the determinative issues will be and kind of you know putting a bit of a wedge in there to try and bring things to a consensual resolution more quickly as opposed to being a bit more scattershot in approach right so laser sharp focus ability to identify uh, the most important issues i guess are some of the examples of personal qualities that separate um elite litigators that work on extremely high stakes matters. Can you mention some other personal qualities that distinguish such litigators? If I had to be honest, you know, in my practice, and I've, I've said the word before and I'll say it again, I think the most important thing is resilience. Um, there are, you know, I've, I've seen some tweets lately, you know, both you and I are, are members of so-called law Twitter, and I saw somebody tweet recently about the fact that, you know, the practice of law and litigation in particular is kind of a pendulum swing between um, ego, between feeling at the one end your best and the highest, um, and at the other end, you know, feeling your lowest because of errors or mistakes that are made. And when you practice at a high level in complex matters, um, you know, it, there is, I find much less room for error. And I'm much harder on myself about mistakes that are made because, you know, mistakes can be of significant consequence, whether financially or otherwise reputationally for a client. Um, and so it's trying to work through the fact that none of us are perfect and we might make mistakes that are of consequence, but being able to, to bounce back, being able to uh, take those experiences, take 
constructive feedback uh, and continue to learn uh, because you know neither of us know it all and 20 years from now I still won't know it all so it's that ability to realize that you don't know everything um, you're not as good as you think you are um, but you should still get up and live to fight another day because you'll learn from whatever the experiences are so that's really been I think that the most important quality in getting me to where I am today, because there have been high points, but there have also been low points, as I'm sure you can empathize with. Yes, yes. I also want everyone to note how excellent and pertinent Chantel's memory is. She already pulled two really good quotes in support of her argument today that sort of added color to what she's saying, added really good relevant examples. This is, you know, when, when you have top tier, really good advocacy skills, they just shine through and uh, an experienced observer can easily tell. So, I mean, I, I also do litigation and uh, I guess I, I can be a good judge of, of uh, relevant skills. So I wanted to highlight one more personal quality, a great memory and ability to uh, make relevant arguments. Um, and I think it's also, of course, related to uh, being able to have laser sharp focus, as you said. Technology, you are known in the bar as a uh, uh, proponent, proponent of uh, technology and litigation. You uh, participated in uh, relevant uh, uh, sections, uh, the Ontario Bar Association, I think with the Advocate Society, you did some work, right? So why technology? Where is this interest from? Is it because technology can make a difference in high stakes litigation or do you have some personal connection to technology? No, I don't have any personal connection and not sure whether you remember, but I certainly do. In my first year of law school, I didn't have a computer. So I was one of the students who wrote all my notes and summaries by hand uh, throughout my first year. So certainly wasn't very high up the curve on technology whenever I started out. Um, but I had the good fortune back in, I guess it's 2015, uh, I was on a, a lengthy trial on the commercial list and uh, it was a misuse of confidential information case. And our case management judge uh, wanted us to do things in the most efficient way possible. And including the use of electronic documents, which now with the age of COVID, that's kind of table stakes. But at the time, um, a lot of people, at least not in Toronto, were doing things exclusively electronically. Um, so we had to work through as a team what the best manner of presentation was going to be. Um, and obviously, there is your ordinary type of electronic trial. But what we decided to do in that case, and I'll actually bring in a prop. Here's my third piece of advocacy assistance. Um, my iPad, which I never go anywhere without, we decided to do an iPad trial, meaning that all of the counsel and the judge actually navigated the case on a tablet. So there were no hard copy briefs um, and we shared everything using iPad technology in the case, including loading up the briefs for the judge, um, displaying evidence, all things like that using tablets. And after that trial finished, I wrote an article about my experience and just how much easier and more efficient it was, um, but also, how much easier it was to get the judge and more senior counsel to actually do things electronically using a form of hardware that was easy for them to use. You know, a laptop isn't second nature for most, but a tablet is really just, you know, push the button and then the application opens. Uh, so I wrote an article that was published in the Advocates Journal and things really snowballed from there. After I published that article, I started to get speaking opportunities um, and I started to become more invested in the area, started doing consulting internally and externally on the conduct of electronic litigation uh, and iPad trials. And over the past five years or so, uh, have really just tried to refine my skills and my expertise. And obviously, there's been a huge boon in the use of technology for litigation. So uh, I was fortunate to get in relatively early and kind of establish myself as one of the, I guess now kind of the, the pioneers of, of iPad trials, at least in, in this province. Uh, Chantel, what words of advice can you say to uh, law students or very, very junior lawyers who are interested in uh, joining a firm like Davies or a similar firm? 
the, the biggest piece of advice, and it probably sounds trite, but it, I can't emphasize it enough, is to, to be yourself. You know, I came from a background where I was the first person on either side of my family to go to university, uh, let alone law school. Um, you know, I grew up with a family where there were no professionals in my family. My father was a roofer, my mom a server. Um, and so I didn't really have any kind of role models in the legal industry apart from Matlock to look to. Uh, so I didn't come in with, with many expectations. Um, but what I wanted to do was make sure that I joined a firm where I actually felt comfortable and didn't feel like I was being put into a box because I didn't know what the box was at that point in time. I didn't know how a lawyer was supposed to act. I had never had an office job, let alone a job in a law firm. Um, so I was really just focused on finding a place where I felt like I was doing top quality work, but that the people also allowed me to be myself and didn't require me to be some kind of you know, paradigm of what a lawyer should be. Um, and that is really held true. That was what was my intention when I, I joined Davies. And as I said, you know, all these years later, 11 years later, I'm still with the firm because I still am the person I was in law school. You know, I, I was mentioning to you before we got started today, Pula, that actually with the, the advent of COVID, I've moved back to Barrie. So I'm joining all of you today from Barrie, uh, where I've been practicing for the last half of this year. And the firm has been fully supportive of that, right? And um, they know who I am, they know where I'm from, they know what's important to me, that my family, being close to my family is quite important. And as I said, they've been fully supportive. So for me, that was by and large the, the most important thing. And I can't emphasize it enough because you know, you've spent a lot of time to get where you are. Um, people come from a variety of different backgrounds um, and you don't want to end up in a position where you are unhappy or you feel like you can't actually be yourself while practicing law. So that would be my number one suggestion. Well, thank you, Chantel. I wish I heard someone like you uh, 11 years ago. Uh, this is really great advice. Uh, it's been a true pleasure to talk to you today. I'm thankful to you for uh, sharing your time with me and with our viewers and listeners. I really appreciate it. I want to wish uh, the very best uh, in this holiday season to you and to your family. And uh, thank you and have a wonderful uh, holiday and new year. And uh, I'll see you in the new year. Well, thanks very much for having me. Happy holidays to you as well and to everybody else. Thanks.